Um, so I was lucky enough to, to study textiles and fashion when I was at uh, secondary school. So we, we learned about um, the Aral Sea, which um, has been reduced greatly by um, cotton production. And um, this really started me thinking about the fashion industry in, in a different way. Um, but it didn't really, sustainability wasn't really a thing then. It was kind of, you know, linen and that, that was sustainable fashion and that wasn't really what I was interested in. So I went to work in luxury fashion, which, which felt to me like we were producing a small amount of products, um, working with craftspeople and really considering what we were producing. Um, but uh, it got to a point where I felt like I really wanted to do something a little bit different and a little bit more. And I really wanted to delve into sustainability because I'd started reading about um, all these different impacts and how my decisions were, were creating these different problems in the industry. And I really just wanted to learn about that a little bit more. So I took the decision to start working with an artist who was working with dead stock fabrics um, to create interiors and artworks with a Swedish brand and um, at the same time I started reading and I started going to events because I was I was actually very interested in policy change so so in the UK we have something called APPGs which are all party parliamentary groups and um, they are a cross-cutting thing between po uh, with, between politicians and industry so I started attending a couple of their events and chatting to people and just really trying to, to, to learn about what I was interested in in sustainability because it's, it's so broad. I think it's really good to kind of have an idea about where, where you're coming from. So, so I went to those events and started linking with people, a not-for-profit with somebody called Jodie who I met at one of the APPGs. And um, that, th this kind of learning journey inspired me to, to sign up for a master's at um, it's a bit of a mouthful, Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership. So I'm doing a master's in sustainability leadership, which I'm finishing this summer. So, so that, that led me to this, this point. So I, I really wanted to look at the areas of sustainability that people weren't talking about so much, but as somebody with, with quite a quiet voice, I don't really, I, I've never really put myself out there in panels and things like that. So I, I didn't really know how I can use the personality that I have to make the difference that I wanted to make, which is why I, I signed up for this university degree, which has been really brilliant. Um, well, my background is design and product development. So, so I'm, I'm really, really interested in that area. And I love, I love designing. I love looking for fabrics, looking for crafts, people to make things, linking different people with different people. I've done a lot of project management. So, so I've done bicycle designs and notebooks <laughs> and swimwear and um, events and all sorts of things. I really love doing that. But also now I'm finding my interest because I grew up on a farm. I'm really, really interested in the people, the primary producers and the people much further down the supply chain. So so I'm writing a paper at the moment looking at the Mongolian cashmere industry, which is quite niche for the course that I'm doing. And um, this is something that I'm really, really interested in. So are, you get a lot of brands and sustainability people putting information down the supply chain, but are they getting the information back up the supply chain about where the problems are, where the barriers are, why these practices are unsustainable in the first place? And I just don't really feel like that, that conversation is happening. So it's, it's more of a transactional relationship and it needs to be more collaborative. So that's really where, where my interest is at the moment. Well, sustainability is really broad. So if we if we look just at climate change, which is going to impact everyone, I mean, not everyone agrees on that, but I, I think it is going to impact <laughs> everyone. Um, McKinsey came up with a report last year that um, said that if the industry continues on our current path, um, we're going to miss uh, the 1.5 degree pathway, which we have to um, achieve by 2030 by 50%. So the 1.5 degree pathway was um, part of the Paris Agreement, which people may have heard of. And um, we need to keep carbon emissions, we need to keep climate change basically to this 1.5 degree pathway. And even with a 1.5 degree pathway, it's going to have negative impacts. But if we miss that, it's going to have 
pretty pretty bad negative impacts. Um, the IPCC released a report in 2018, so so I recommend reading that. There's certain tipping points within the world, like the um, mm. the, the Amazon rainforest. You've got the permafrost in it, uh, across the top of Russia. If these things start start um, becoming um, carbon emitters. They're currently carbon sinks, but if you reach tipping points, they become carbon emitters and then everything goes, runs away like a runaway train. Oh. But the 1.5 degree pathway wasn't considered to tip these points. Um, the, you need to speak to your supply chain and really um, listen to their feedback about what you're asking them about sustainability. So, so the first, the first, point I would say is work out your hotspots in your supply chain and there's various companies you can work with to work out the hotspots in your supply chain and then really speak to your suppliers about what those hotspots are what they consider to be the the issues around changing that to not be a hotspot anymore because um, a lot of sustainability efforts fail and there are papers about this so sustainable supply chain efforts fail if you don't consider the barriers to um, those um, efforts. So if you're not speaking to your supply chain, then you're not going to know what the barriers are to try to um, mitigate those. Um, well, you need to work out what you're interested in sustainability to begin with, because it's, it's really, really broad. I would recommend sitting through a few webinars and reading some of the resources. There's quite a lot of resources um, available now um, and then work out where you're interested and then really work out the people that are saying things that are that are maybe going against the grain of what the general consensus is because it's a really noisy area right now and a lot of people right. are saying the same things and um, it's not necessarily bad but you're not going to learn things if you just listen to the same people saying the same things all the time and I found it's really helpful when learning to listen to things that I don't necessarily understand and or don't agree with. And it's the people that you don't agree with in the in the industry that are going to cause you the most issues if you're trying to be sustainable. So you have to try and understand things from their perspective. So I really try to, to listen to a broad range of people talking about a broad range of, of um, issues. Yep, definitely. Um, well, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and um, I've co-founded a project called Project, project 2030, um, which we started out looking at um, building a labelling system so consumers are a more, they, they can understand the sustainability of products, but in in um, it, it's, it communicates the sustainability of products in a more understandable way, because at the moment it's, it's really tricky for people to understand. But the, the problem that we came up with was the there's um, quite a, there's a lack of primary data in the industry. So that means using to make their decisions isn't necessarily um, the most accurate. And we were we were a little bit concerned that we were pushing people towards um, things that we felt were less sustainable. So some of the metrics that people are using to make sustainable decisions are comparing apples to oranges and saying that apples are better they're not comparing apples to apples. So, so I would say anyone that's interested in sustainability, really look at the, the data sources that um, you're using to make those decisions and really understand that a lot of this information isn't, isn't gospel. Um, so you do have to make your own decisions as well. It isn't just a tick box thing of you know, finding an organic cotton and thinking that's the best. You have to look at the region that it's coming from and what alternatives there are, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's what I've been working on. We have done some really interesting consumer research and we're going to release that very soon and pivot the project to something called Lab 2030. So that's going to be launching soon. Um, and I really look forward to talking about that a little bit more so people can reach out to me about that. And um, at the end of April, I've written um, an article in a report with a company called Other Day about building regenerative brands. So the concept of regenerative fashion is something that I'm really, really interested in, um, how we can build things that are better through the fashion industry, not just merely um, keep things, you know, the, the concept of sustainability is to um, not take things from the future. 
um, that we are using us at the present. So um, regenerative, I, I just think that at this point, we need to start using the industry to build things back at a better way, not just not take too much away from, from what we're consuming.